So good morning. I'd like to uh, thank the International and my local 1365 for the opportunity to present at this year's symposium. Just watching the video, the hair on my arms and the back of my neck is standing once again uh, 14 months later. And there's a lot of questions and things that surround this event, but due to the short manner of time that we have today, we're going to jump into some of the meat and potatoes of what I really think should be a takeaway for everybody in this room. Something we hear often in our line of work is that it's not a matter of if, but when. When are we going to experience something? And I'm not a what if kind of guy, but I am kind of proactive. I believe in being prepared or at least having the tools necessary to be successful in the event that something like this happens in your department or within your agency through joint response. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said uh, after the 9-11 attacks that we should be prepared for attacks vastly more deadly than that of September 11. And though we've not seen a casualty count anywhere near that of September 11, the methods in which we are being attacked produce rapid loss of life in very short order. So in the essence of time, obviously, we really can't dive into the logistics. The intro video prepared by the IFF summarizes what the members experienced during the Pulse tragedy. An ongoing investigation and other directives have prevented us from speaking directly to the event itself. However, there are a few points that are already publicly available that I feel are important for us to understand. This was a culmination of many things. An active shooter, an MCI, an EOD, a hostage situation, all wrapped up into about a three hour time frame for all the first responders that were there. These, this atypical response that we now face as first responders can be a culmination of many aspects of what we deal with in the fire service, in EMS, and in law enforcement. There's a vast amount of information that's already out there on how to prepare. I listened to some discussions with the Department of Homeland Security yesterday, the FBI. There's a lot of resources that are already out there, and I think that the other presentations you're going to see today are going to allude to a few of the points that I'm going to make up here today. Because there's a trend in all of these atypical events that seem to come up time and time and time again. Reviewing Aurora, San Bernardino, some of the other tragedies, there's bullet points from all of those that keep coming up, but yet we haven't fully embraced those opportunities. First and foremost, a thorough understanding of what Unified Command is. Whether it's top to bottom, bottom to top, law enforcement with fire, and vice versa, we have to understand what that means. If it truly is a law enforcement event, like the Pulse tragedy, the fire department has to fully understand what our role and responsibility is in their unified command structure. We have to use similar terminology, and we have to understand their expectation on a call like this. If this was a high-rise structure fire, it's our call. We're command. And we would expect law enforcement to come to us and fold into our unified command and ask us what they can do to assist us in this call. So a thorough understanding, number one takeaway for me with this call. Understanding an MCI and the roles and responsibility of your members and setting up your groups and divisions and such, I think we all do that pretty well. Understanding what the EOD operations are, if you don't already have that within your organization, I encourage you to partner with somebody that does and understand what they do in that situation. Look at some of the current executive, accepted active shooter training that's available. The two that come to the forefront for me are the tech program, the tactical emergency casualty care, and SAVE, which is the swift assisted victim extraction. For us and our surrounding agencies, all the law enforcement and surrounding fire and EMS utilize the SAVE protocol, which is the tactical portion of what you do. We recently just certified our entire department in tech. The upcoming NFPA 3000, which is currently under development, will help provide some guidance and direction for us in the fire service. And make sure that your policy and procedures, your equipment, your commitment to training, and your continuous improvement programs follow those models so that we can better prepare for these atypical events. Make sure you have good multi-agency interoperability. Can't even express that. 
between fire, EMS, law enforcement, your hospitals, everybody has to come to the table and talk about what to do or what we do in pre-planning for something of this nature. Make sure your joint response agreements are in place. And again, that doesn't just include the surrounding fire departments. That includes private ambulance. That includes the hospitals. That includes if you have assets like aeromedical transport available. All of them have to come to the table and be part of that planning process. And most importantly as well is work with your respective police departments or sheriff's departments, whatever it is, and implement an adopted standard of practice. That goes back all the way to number one, understanding the unified command. That was a huge challenge, not for myself or the members, the boots that were on the ground, but that was a huge challenge for our organization on this event and in the days to follow. So I encourage the chiefs, the leaders, the city managers, anybody that's in here that can influence that to understand unified command. So I was asked uh, after the event what was the most difficult task, and Dr. Moore alluded to that we're going to segue into peer support, which really I think is the, the hot button right now. What was the most difficult task I observed? You saw in the video, and maybe you couldn't make it out, my command post was no more than 50 feet from the triage area where we saw these victims being removed, rapidly triaged, and loading into the awaiting transports to be transported to our trauma center. In most cases, in a non-MCI scenario, an individual with a couple gunshots, we would probably work that individual, especially with a trauma center three blocks away. But a fireman had to make a decision based on his training, based on his skills, on whether or not this individual gets a chance to survive or not. And in this case, not. Placing a black tag on a patient with agonal respirations with multiple gunshot wounds to the chest received a black tag. And this fireman did it, placed the black tag, and moved on to the next victim that was in the triage area. Pretty tough thing to see. Couldn't imagine having it been the one to do it. So what's important? As we regroup and we conduct our after action reviews, our SOP revisions, and policy changes, as we react to the situations, we must make sure that we ensure the mental health and well-being of those who work these high stress, high acuity calls. We must show them we care. It's our responsibility. There's a lot of things in place, a lot of tools already available through the IAFF. Our local program is UCF Restores. Lieutenant Orange is gonna talk about our peer support group. The IAFF was there immediately in the day following. Representative from the Boston tragedy, we had individuals that were part of other tragedies across the country that were there within 24 hours notice. Thank you. But we have to show them we care. These are our boots on the ground, our assets that have been asked to carry out these, these very duties and responsibilities. Leverage those tools that you have that are available to help and heal. The use of peer support was vital and continues to be an important part of what we do. So with that, I introduce Lieutenant Jeff Orange, our peer support team coordinator. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Um, I only have 10 minutes to try to summarize what we've been doing for the last 14 months. So with that, my natural witty banter and humor is gonna have to be put on hold for a longer lecture. With that being said, if I do hear you guys laughing, it's gonna be awkward because I'm not telling any jokes up here today. So I'm gonna to try to summarize, like I said, in 10 minutes what we did for the guys who responded to this incident. I'm gonna pick up where Chief Davis left off. How do you show them that you care? How do you take a guy who went from this hypothetical situation of placing a black tag for years in training on a dummy to actually having to do it to somebody who is still breathing? How do you lead them down the path to getting healthy? Well, if you would ask me this 14 months ago, I would have said, maybe I have an idea, but I don't know because there's no roadmap. There was no roadmap, and there still really is no roadmap. This is something that you have to tailor to your department. But I was smart enough back then to know that if President Schaefberger calls my local president and says, hey, we got a team of guys that we're willing to send down and help you guys with this, do you guys need help? 
I was smart enough to say yes. And I thank you. And Pat, I thank you as well. Frank, if you're out there, Brian, Angelo, Sheila, Brendan, I thank you guys. Because they came down in the wake of this tragedy where we were trying to figure out what we're going to do. And they helped us create this roadmap. Uh, if nothing else, they gave us the confidence that what we'd been doing two years before really hadn't gone in vain. That we were well ahead of the, well ahead of the mark of where a lot of places are when they're dealing with something like this. So what I had to do and what I've done over the last 14 months is I had to put it in terms that I understand. We know that we got to gather information from the people who've been there. And how do we do that? Well, I put it in terms of fire ground information. How do we gather fire ground information? We do it in one of three ways. There's pre-planning, there's visual and audible, and there's reconnaissance. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how each of those have tied in to this incident and the incidents that have followed. I'm not a smart guy, but after 21 years of this stuff being pounded into my head, I realized that this could be an application that we could use for our guys as well, some kind of roadmap. So pre-planning, this is probably the most important part of your peer support team. This has to happen well before the incident happens. If you don't start your pre-planning, you're gonna be behind the eight ball when this thing actually does happen. So how do you do that? You build a solid foundation. And what is your foundation? Your foundation is trust. What we did is we started driving from station to station on our off days, telling them about this program that was coming out, a program to assist them if they were having problems in their life at work, that we could direct them to the resources to get them better. And what that did was that, build, that built that foundation of trust. At that cornerstone was, was confidentiality, and they knew it. They started trusting us, and they started talking to each other. Even at the tables when we were sitting there, they started talking about issues that they might be facing and how they got on that road to recovery. And they started normalizing some of the problems that they had. And they started breaking down that stigma, and they were talking to each other. And it worked on its own. We didn't even have to force anything. Through those talks, we started building up trusted members. So if you think that Jeff Orange is a jerk and you're never going to talk to that guy, you don't have to. You can talk to Joe McLuhan or Ed Merkel or Pat Kelly or Tim Capps or Mike McGurk or one of the other 20 members that we got on our team. You don't have to come to me. And the last thing that we did was we scoured our local resources to see what was available. We looked at how our EAP system worked. We looked at United Healthcare, our healthcare provider, and what they could provide for our guys. And lastly, we stumbled upon a program called UCF Restores, and it's University of Central Florida. And we found three advocates of ours that were instrumental in helping our guys. Matty Marks, Dr. Beidel, and Dr. Bowers. They've been working with uh, returning soldiers dealing with PTSD, and their success rates were huge. And they were translating these into first responders. And they had a program. And best of all, it was free. So nothing's going to attract our members more than something free. And that's what they went to. So far to date, we've had over 10% of our guys go to this program with a lot of success. But all this was done through pre-planning. The next step was the visual and audible. Well, what do I mean by that? We racked our brains on how we were going to get to these guys and talk to them. And what we decided that, that with 75 members, we gathered three informational sessions, 25 members each, and we brought them to our union hall, and we had coffee and donuts, and we sat them down, and we told them about their resources, and we told them about things that they might experience or that their families might experience during the wake of this. And then afterwards, we said, go have some free food and free coffee. And like I said before, there's nothing that firemen like more than something free. So when they broke into these little groups, they started talking to each other. And we were able to pick up on these visual and audible clues that they were telling. And they led us into their circles. And we made mental notes. And we started thinking, OK, this guy's suffering. we got to check up on this guy. But we were able to pick up on those clues. And the last thing is reconnaissance. If you're on side alpha, if your command post is set up on side alpha, how do you get your information from side Charlie? Reconnaissance. We set up a buddy system. Well, I can't take credit for setting up a buddy system. That's been in place since the fire service started. But we realized that you are probably going to look out for the person sitting next to you more than you're even going to look out for yourself. And we tapped into that. And we would ask the guys, hey, how's everybody holding up? And they would talk to us. 
And what we realized is that they, in looking out for each other, they were all getting each other help. Hey, firefighter Johnny's, you know, he's not acting, acting normal. You know, he's, he's showing up five minutes to eight when he was normally there. And we could check in on those guys because the buddy system was working. And every department has a buddy system. So through those three ways, we were able to gather information and get those guys the help that they needed. But we realized that if we stopped there, we were falling short. So we would never leave the scene of a fire without checking for hot spots. If there was a fire on the stove and we didn't check the cabinets, we know that we would be coming back later for probably a bigger fire than we, what we responded to in the first place. So we knew that we had to follow up. And our follow-ups looked like this. One week after, we would just stop into the station. Very informal. Hey, how's everybody holding up? We'd have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with each other, with everybody. And they would let us know. And then we did the same thing at a month then three months. And then at six months, we had some coffee and donuts at the Union Hall and invited everybody down and said, hey, you don't have to talk about Pulse. You don't have to talk about your feelings. You don't have to talk about anything. You can just come share some coffee and donuts and sit around the table. And people started talking. And they started talking to each other and they started talking to us and they started breaking down that stigma even more. Um, if you don't follow up, if you don't do that overhaul, you're gonna be coming back to a bigger fire. You have to, that's part of this grand scheme. Let the guys know that you're there. In May, we did a one year follow up. We wanted to be ahead of the anniversary of Pulse. So what we did was we invited the guys down again, free food, free drinks, nothing lures firemen like that. We broke them up into small groups throughout the month of May. Groups no longer than, no bigger than 10 to 12 people at a time. And we said, you don't have to talk about anything. But what we realized is that they did. People started telling us what they had been through for the last year. They weren't telling us, they were telling other crew members. And they were telling each other how they were navigating those things that they had encountered in the last year. And it was working. Everybody was sharing. Now there's a joke going around that if you stare at me long enough, you're probably gonna catch PTSD. I'm not a doctor, and I don't know that that's the way to catch PTSD, but I will tell you guys that after this, you should probably all go get checked. Uh, just a little word of warning. But even with that, guys were still catching on and guys were talking to each other and nudging each other to go get help. Um, it was working. The last thing is we knew that we had to do self-preservation. It used to be a badge of honor to come back from a fire, gritty and just nasty and you were eating the smoke and no, you weren't going to let anybody have your gear to go wash it because that was how you knew that you were in there doing it. Your helmet's all gnarly. And then we realized that over the long term, we were getting sick. And that was one of the things that was making us sick is not washing our gear, not doing this self-decon, not, not taking care of ourselves. And the same thing applies to this. You're going to be talking to a lot of people. You're gonna be carrying a lot of their problems. And if you burn out, and if you don't do that self-decon, that self-preservation, then you're gonna be no good to the people that you wanna help. Go talk to that therapist that you're sending everybody to. Trust me, they're not gonna be able to shrink your head the way you think they are. Well, they might be able to, but it looks a lot different than what you'd imagine from Frazier. So go talk to that guy, take care of yourself. Do that self-decon, that self-preservation. I want to thank you, and I want to thank you, because we had no idea how to tackle this. But the IFF cares, and this is something on the forefront. Please, if you take anything else from this, take the fact that you can't wait till tomorrow to start this. Don't start this pre-planning when the incident happens. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Make sure that you're taking care of the guys. So I thank you for your time. Please take care of each other and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job.